At this performance, the roles of strange deer hosts, usually played by Juliana Valente and Kay Cook, will be played by Donna Murphy and Sutton Foster. Just kidding. Hi, guys. We're still here, even though it looks like I'm ready for my day off to let my understudy <laughs> take my role. But I decided that uh, today's theme is going to be kind of fun, slash, it, yeah. this is something that really... I'm saying fun because I have very passionate feels about what we're talking about today, yes. Juliana. Uh, and that would be the, we're kind of going to explode the myth today about what's an understudy, what's this alternate, what's a standby, what's a swing, I don't understand. Um, but before we get into the meat of that, uh, well, first of all, hi guys, it's Kay. Not, not like, hi, <laughs> and it's Juliana over not, here. Don't know our names by now. We just have notes to ourselves to be like, always make sure you say your name so they know who's who. Not that they haven't figured out by now that Kay's the casual one in a robe and Juliana always looks so done and put together. Uh, <laughs> but how's your, how was your week, my dear? Uh, week's good. You know, it's just, uh, it, I, it's, I'm hashtag blessed to be doing uh, a few shows at a time or prepping a few shows at a time. So it's busy, but it's blissfully busy. I'm not complaining at all. You're doing what you want to be doing. And that's, yeah. Awesome. yeah. So awesome. Yeah. I, you know, I did a, uh, I got to sing in the benefit this past, uh, weekend. Uh, what'd you say? Uh, I got to, well, it was funny because it was benefit for studio players where I'm going to be doing into the woods in November. And, um, I just met my wife two hours before we sang it takes two, which was just terrific fun. Got it. Uh, <laughs> And then we each got to sing a song of our own. So you probably remember me doing a rough draft version of what baking can do for one of yes. your vocal seminars, Juliana. Yep. And uh, I let it have a full ride. And I expected to just have a piano player. I had a full band behind me. So it felt kind of fantastic. Uh, had a good time. Had a good time. And we had a lot of really fantastic young uh, singers, young, they're in like a summer camp situation. They travel yeah. this thing around. They're going to be doing the Heathers this weekend. Yes. Um, and they were basically, this is like a fundraiser for the theater slash they get to get on stage and perform. And they had, uh, two Broadway actors there as our guest stars. One who is Ben Liebert, who is directing into the woods, um, who is currently starring in Fiddler on the Roof with the National Yiddish Theater in New York City. I need to get my tickets to that. Uh, and Danny Zoli, who, uh, I believe, the most recent thing he did, the Jesus Christ Superstar revival, he was like the alternate Judas, or look at how, or, or like the full listed Judas, whatever it was, but it okay. ties back to the theater world. Um, yeah. But anyway, so I had a fabulous time doing that, and um, I look forward to actually getting to now do, you know, character work with Lauren, who was playing the baker's wife, as opposed to us just kind of sitting and going, well, we have a half hour before we sing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess in that way too, I've been having a, you know, it was a busy week, but a good week. I've had a couple of good things yeah. in my quote day job that is related to theater too. So yeah. there are good developments going on here. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're going to dive into the meat of this episode. But first. Right, so what is this thing that got Kay's dander all this week? Well, an article hit the New York Post about 10 days ago now. Um, it, this is, somebody could argue, Juliana, this is one of our favorite whipping horses because we did kind of lay into the revival of My Fair Lady in our live show. Yes, uh, we did. A couple months ago. <laughs> but uh, current star Lauren Ambrose, who is playing Eliza Doolittle, um, announced, uh, again, this is about 10 days ago, that she was going to be stepping back her performance rotation, only doing seven shows a week, handing off the Sunday matinee to her understudy, Kirsten Anderson. Um, and you know, this is not unheard of in the theater world. I'm putting this out there nice and early, by the way, Yeah. but because apparently this upset her co-star, Dame Diana Rigg, who is playing Mrs. Higgins. Um, the article that ran in the post, uh, basically, uh, First, it starts off with talking about uh, an email that uh, Dame Rigg sent to management. How the New York Post get these things, I don't know. They just do. Um, but in today's social media world, you should probably, whatever you put in an email, be ready to defend. Um, when the company was informed that Lauren Ambrose was going to be stepping back and not performing the Sunday matinees, uh, Diana Rigg's reaction was, and I quote, I learned courtesy of a newspaper that our leading lady will not be appearing in future Sunday matinees. Now, call me old-fashioned, which I unashamedly am, but I don't think this development is fair to audiences. They've booked their seats in advance, paying an exorbitant price for them to see what they have been led to believe is the original cast. 
The very least we can do as actors is to acknowledge their presence as a privilege and take care never to abuse it. It's time managements put their audiences first and insist on the old adage slightly adapted by me, the show must go on with all principles. Like, these are some pretty strong words. Yeah. Um, and there's further commentary, because the New York Post, of course, immediately having intercepted this, however, they got their hands on this email, um, called her for comment, as one might, and she followed it up with, I'm flying the old flag for a generation of actors who performed even when they were at death's door, but I suppose it's a tradition that's been lost. It's the norm these days, so I guess I should just shut up. And it goes on to mention how Diana Rigg did indeed win a Tony in 94 for Medea, um, an award that, yes, it was very earned, it was a fantastic performance, but one that came with a pretty steep price because she also infamously tore a vocal cord while in that run. So, um, and also it goes on to quote other production sources because, and you know what, I'm just going to call it out because Michael Riddell really is kind of the gossip monger of backstage. Yes, I was hoping world. that you would like, just point that out. I'm just going to put his name out there because, <laughs> you know, if it's, if it's got the hint of gossip to it and it's a Broadway piece, it's him. Yeah. Um, cause he used another production source. That's whoever he was yeah. able to get catch coming out of the backstage door. Um, <laughs> aggressive, kind of a passive aggressive quote here from someone saying that clearly Ambrose is worn out by the show and her commute from some crunchy granola town she lives in upstate has been affecting her performance. So like, there's a lot here. Um, I would also just like to point out that the entire article is pretty passive aggressive toward Lauren Ambrose um, with quotes like right from the beginning saying clearly the show is too taxing. Uh, that's Michael Riddell in his author voice. That's not a quote from anybody putting that out there and that she will be skipping Sunday performances, which makes this professional actress sound like some sort of a high school drama club truant. Oh, I have a lot of thoughts here right now, Juliana. Yeah. Um, we're going to be talking, uh, in the next segment, kind of explaining because non-theater people, I think it's important for us to understand the difference between an understudy, an alternate, a standby, uh, what all of these terms mean. But and then we're going to soapbox it a little bit later too, but I wanted to start off just by mentioning that this article had happened. Like the moment I read this, I sent this to you. Yes, you did. <laughs> because I have so many thoughts on this. I mean, we're yes. both very theater people. We both had the experience of seeing that the understudy is going to be going on. Um, and I just... Give me a quick hot take. We'll give you, we'll give some hot takes quickly on this before we go into other things. Uh, from, from my perspective? Yeah. Uh, there is a precedent for using an alternate. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not a new thing. Um, I feel a little suspicious about um, the cattiness mm -hmm. of the situation um, because I have found that there is, there's not as much drama uh, in professional organizations as some people would like to think. So it's hard for me to imagine this actually happening mm -hmm. um, sure of the quote. And then I also have to acknowledge that there is a little bit of, the, of a tendency with um, not necessarily an older generation, but people who have been doing something a long time of like, whenever I hear people say, I guess I should just shut up. Mm. Um, <laughs> That's kind of one of the most it's, passive aggressive things, I think. Well, it's like either shut up or... or <laughs> you have feel. Bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this isn't a new thing. This sounds like more of a personal thing so, than yeah. a theater professionalism issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no. So actually, you know what? And, and, and it. I also want to point out that one thing that, that stuck out to me is that um, the article did point out that the rest of the cast wasn't notified in a formal way. Uh -huh. That that in particular, um, she learned of Lauren uh, using an alternate on su Sundays or... Is that what it yeah, was? It's, it's going to be Sunday matinees now. For okay, Sunday. Uh, she learned that through social media. She learned that th through the internet. As opposed so, to, yeah. It's, yeah, so so I can, I also understand that there are a lot of feelings um, around being kind of like the last to know about something. Yeah, true enough, true enough. 
Um, and I also want to point out that there was one nice ballast that came out of this. There's a great quote from Andre uh -huh. Bishop. Andre Bishop, who is the Lincoln Center artistic director, by the way. Uh, the decision for Lauren to perform seven performances a week was made due to the intense demands of this enormous taxing role. Eliza requires a singing actress who can belt and sing in a high operatic range as well. Julie Andrews often said and wrote, there were performances of My Fair Lady where she wasn't sure she could make it to the end of the show. The most important thing is that Lauren protects her stamina to continue to deliver beautiful shows to our audiences. Um, that, I, it didn't totally redeem the article for me because again, I took, a lot of, uh, I took a lot of issue with the tone. And yeah, we do feel that some of it is probably the author's tone on that, but at the same time, it's, it was you know aggressive towards her. Yes. And um, I found that to be unfair. But you know what? Instead of hopping to another segment, Juliana, do you want to talk to us about the differences between an understudy, an alternate, a standby, those kind sure. of things? Because yeah, what are, what, what, let's demystify that a little bit. Okay, great. And I think uh, I'm going to use these terms as they specifically apply to musical theater because it's a little bit different in straight theater sure, yeah, yeah. Um, because the demands are a little different. Okay. Um, so in musical theater, uh, when you have a role, any any lead role uh, or supporting role, a named role is going to have most of the time an understudy. And an understudy is a member of the cast who learns all the all the lines, all the blocking, all the intentions, uh, all the backstage movements of a lead character. But they're also another supporting character or ensemble member in the show, and they are there to go on in in the case that that. Um, lead player or named pit player is sick, on leave, um, or for whatever reason can't be there. Mm -hmm. Now, when an understudy goes on and they kind of like get promoted to that lead role position uh, for a certain show, there's now a gap in the casting. There you so, track, yes. That's right. So there, so there's a, a person called a swing who will now fill in that track. Now, swing is also a member of the ensemble who has learned multiple tracks mm -hmm. uh, in the show. A track is, uh, so in the ensemble, you're not just kind of like standing around in a clump. You're a character with the your own costume plot. Uh, you often have small lines or solo bits or certain dances. Maybe you're in a different um, position for the dance. Maybe you're not in the dance at all right. between characters. So a swing will now fill in uh, the gap that the understudy has left. Yep. Okay. All right. Now, when a um, role is particularly taxing or demanding or it's a like a star uh, vehicle, you will have a standby. A standby is not a person in the show. Their job is to show up at the theater and stand by and in case there is an emergency and they have to go on at a moment's notice. Now, like in Broadway contracts, you have to be a certain distance from the theater um, during the show. I don't know. Those are so fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I, like, I've seen this language in contracts before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, yeah, in the contract, you've got to be, you know, certain you've got you've got to area be yeah. in a certain amount of time so if someone if something happens in act one you can go on and say act two and for there the are stand lots of examples of that oh yeah definitely yeah. some on stage hazard or um right since what comes to mind andy carl who was performing the lead in um, groundhog day last year actually managed to tear his acl in a dance move in the first act of a performance and he had to be taken to the hospital. So he had the other guy swing in to take Don't it. Don't use that word, that's too confusing. Uh, well, no, but come in, <laughs> alternate. He was standing guy. by. Standing yeah. by, he, he was probably standing by at a cafe nearby, whatever it was, and he mm -hmm. came in. So yeah, you're right, don't use swing. <laughs> to come in and not swing in because that could also lead to another ACL tear. Uh, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then that leaves us with an alternate. And an alternate is a person who learns the lead role and they, they actually step in for regularly scheduled uh, performances. So for example, if you're a big star, you could, um, part of your contract could be what they would call like a six show. Um, contract where you would have an alternate come in for two shows a week. Uh, Lauren Ambrose in this case is, have, is now has a seven show contract, which means for one performance a week, regularly scheduled, an alternate will come by. Alternates are usually used when they're like maybe too young for the role, but, but um, uh, still ha would ha have an audience pull or, or good for that. Um, 
a great example that's more most recent, Hello Dolly, when Bette Midler yeah. was in for the first run exactly. with um, Donna Murphy. Yes, right. Who is exactly. a fantastic Broadway star in her own right, P.S. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I never saw it, but I, I yeah. actually, um, when I was trying to get tickets, I was trying to get, uh, like, lottery tickets and, and rush tickets, I was trying to get them for Donna Murphy. Where you, there you go. There you go. I mean, it, yeah. That, and, um, yeah, quite frankly, anybody who was like, I read some tourist account of, like, who was completely unaware that Bette Midler wasn't doing eight shows a week and was so disappointed to see Donna Murphy. And I'm like, honey, <laughs> you don't understand. You're about to have a heck of a show. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, and we should point out the fact that these, this kind of t terrorist uh, levels of employment mm -hmm. are just that. And typically in, in this, a career trajectory, we performers will have to usually step through all of those. We're not all of a sudden going to be the Bette Midler headliners, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so most of us are going to be ensemble members at some point. Um, if we are aggressive and we want to make some extra cash, we would love to be hired on as a swing to, to learn the multiple roles. And swings usually get paid really well because it's a huge job. You've got to learn kind of different shows kind of almost. It's such a skill set. I had a friend who was in a tour of Marvelous Wonderettes for a while. And she was their universal swing for all four ladies. So she had, she, oh. her, her script was in, it was color coded four ways. Yeah. She, and it was all color coded to the costume she was wearing. Yeah. Like, it, it is such a skill set. I think it's a, it is a skill set, and uh, I think it's a it, if you can be a, a swing, that is something that really credits. Talk about um, skills. <laughs> how how great you are as a performer, but also like as a as a, as a person to work with. Oh, yeah. So it's these are these are all things you know. I feel like in the community in general of, of people who are like really on their game. To have to to be an understudy or a swing, um, is is not a dig. Like I, I don't think it, it 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 points you out as someone who is a less than performer at all. But it usually says you know I'm not super established in my career. I'm not making uh, five digits a night with every performance. Um, I'm work so so there is this idea of um, paying your dues. One might say if you're um, of a more traditional background mm -hmm. that, yeah, it's very traditional to pay your dues by being an understudy, by being a swing. Oh, yeah. um, and a lot of, a lot of then going on to be established people started that way. I mean, how many yeah. stories have we heard that like, Oh, they were the understudy and they stepped in and like the audience loved them. And Sutton so I mean, Foster a lot, a and lot Millie. Of, yes, yep. A lot of careers yep. were made mm -hmm. by people who went on as understudies or standbys. So this is, this is not make-believe. This is an actual way that some people become household names, where they they might be regularly working performers, but they're they have a big moment when they come on as an understudy. Now let's think of it from a pro producer's point of view, mm -hmm. who their job is to make money. They don't have to create the art, right? They, yeah, right. they how can they make this? They have to have a show go. Yeah. Money. Yeah, how, how can they make everybody make money? And um, and that's that's why we have to hire people as standbys, hire people as understudies, hire people as swings, so that the show can go on and everyone makes money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't I can't let us wrap up this segment before I give a shout out to who is now my best buddy in the world and gave me the best understudy experience of my life, Jess Katz, when we did a year ago, Juliana, a new brain. Almost exactly. Yeah. And she she knew she wasn't going to be available to play Mimi for one weekend. And, and I got to step into that and yep. she was kind of the ideal like she and I literally we, we had like a two-headed Mimi going on and the fact that yep. she and I are going to get to sing together now a duet <laughs> in the woods um you know we've gone from sharing the same songs to uh, you know at different performances to sharing a song at every night so that that's kind right of <laughs> and, and and by the way that's so typical of the in the theater community right we're all kind of flipping and flopping and sometimes we're leads and sometimes we're supporting and sometimes we're straight men and somewhat sometimes we're the comic guy, you know, mm -hmm. that flexibility I feel is just as respectable uh, as other qualities. Yeah, exactly. Which we'll talk about later. Meet it with gratitude in theater. Always meet it with gratitude. Yeah. Hey guys, if you're new to 
our channel, Strange Deer, Kay and I put out a new theater-centric podcast video every week. It's usually Thursday night, plus bonus episode uh, uploads throughout the week. So if you don't follow us already, go ahead and hit subscribe to be notified of future episodes and join our Strange Deer community. You can follow us at Strange Deer on Instagram and Twitter and Tumblr. And we also have a Facebook page at Strange Deer. I'm You're gonna, so magical. I'm going to be editing. Yeah, I'm now hating myself in the editing room right now. Sorry, Future <laughs> K. Sorry, Future K. Oh, so much better. Bye bye, towel. Juliana was like, I think you have curlers under that towel. And I was like, no, let me prove to you that this is my ratty, wet hair. I uh, thought you were going to be like, all of a sudden, like Vanna White. And oh, God, no. Have this sequins is, underneath your robe. And... This is air dry hair in the extreme. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Juliana, let me set a scene for you. <clears throat> okay. I'm a very first time ever in my life theater goer. I'm on vacation in cultural New York City with my family, and we've decided to purchase tickets to see a Broadway show. How, co Ooh. how cosmopolitan of me and my sweet Midwestern nuclear family. Um, <laughs> so we go into the theater, and their nice usher man hands me a program, and I open it up, and what? <gasps> a white piece of paper flutters into my lap. Oh, no. Perplexed, I turn to my husband. He has no idea what this is. I ask my 2.5 children. They too are confused, but happy oh. to be in an air conditioned space where they can sit and kick the back of the chair in front of them to their little heart's content. Yes, all 2.5 of their hearts. <clears throat> um, I turn to you, Juliana, who is seated somewhere in my vicinity. Hopefully my kids aren't kicking your chair or this won't go well. To explain to me why at this performance, the role of Jenna Hunterson, usually performed by Sarah Bareilles, will be performed by Jack Black and the roles usually <laughs> I want to see that so bad. And the roles usually performed by Mr. Black will be performed by a lawn sprinkler? I'm so disappointed. Yeah. Should I be disappointed? Like, why did I spend my money on these tickets? Help me feel better. Go? Yeah, what do I do as my kids kick your chair? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, especially 0.5. Horatio is a bad yeah. day. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bad day for everybody. Yeah, but, but, but like, what, what do I do? Why, you know, this sucks. Make me feel better about this. Oh, well, I would probably just start by giving you definitions and letting you know that the understudy is really, really great. You think so? Ab I know so. They would not have, they would not have hired this person as an understudy. And it, this is a gift. We get to see a special performance. This person, in my head, I feel like that person's going to give a little more have a little bit more of a soulful experience because this is an honor and a treat for them. Fine, I'll give it a chance, but I was really looking forward to seeing Sarah. Do you think Jack will be okay? Um, he'll be amazing. I can guarantee you that. And then Kay pops up next to Juliana wanting to brain my children. This just got really weird. Everybody around you is my face, Juliana. Just imagine that. <laughs> that's, my, that's my dream. <laughs> I turn around and I go... The lawn sprinkler is really talented, too. Uh, <laughs> this is my way into kind of letting us have a little bit more of a soapbox about kind of the okay. biases in theater about understudies and why, okay. you know, why we got to be this way. Why, you know, not just the audience not giving understudies a chance, but I feel like in some ways kind of the biases in the theater community at times and like why we've got this lovely redundancy situation that you've pointed out, Juliana, you know, this is really to everybody's benefit to have this in place. Yeah. And yet we kind of, you know, it, it's kind of in a way treated like a dirty word. Like, yeah, I wrote my little scenario because I've seen it a lot, particularly with the summer tourist season and people going, but I wanted to see Hugh Jackman. Like it's kind of famous, I guess that Hugh Jackman did have an understudy in the boy from Oz, but he never went on. Never went on. Yeah. <laughs> because it was like, they knew nobody wanted to see his understudy in the boy from Oz. And it's like, I think that's kind of sad. Yeah. It's, you know, it's easy for me to put on my producer head. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think that's one of my, one of my strengths as a performer that one of the reasons I feel like I have thick skin is because it's easy for me to click into producer mode. Okay. Yeah. Um, but also from, you know, just from personal experience, like if you look at this only from a sheer money make as a business, mm -hmm. right. Um, you're, yeah, you're going to, you're going to cover your back 
you're going to have not only a plan B, but a plan C. You're going to have a rain plan. You're going to have a plan for anything that might go on. And that is specifically how the show goes on. Also, you're going to want to take care of the health of your performers. That is also specifically how the show will go on. Yeah. <laughs> can we, can we yeah. let me you finish your thought, but I want to pop out from that about performer health. Go, go, go gadget. Uh, yeah. And, and just there in also floating in the back of your head is the idea that sometimes people get cast as the lead roles because they are famous mm. and will bring a very large fan uh, gathering to all the performances. You're going to sell more tickets. You're going to make more money. And so when you have Hugh Jackman, who every, everybody knows as <laughs> Wolverine, et cetera, et cetera, and um, other like not brand name, excellent performer right. who uh, is going to bring in maybe his, you know, 5,000 Twitter fo followers. Money wise, you're going to put in the person who's got the bigger jaw. It's not at this point, if given two talents, you're going to go with what makes more money. If when performers understand that it's not a personal thing, it's, you know, you just and keep understudy and you keep going in a supporting roles until you get you know and i think that's also why there is specific i don't i could have looked this up but you know it's specifically with when the show has the actor's name above the title audiences can even put in for a refund right i believe that's what yeah. i've heard yes correctly. absolutely okay, yeah, yeah. Yep. um yeah yeah, but now I want to I want to bing back because I I happen to agree with you as far as this is concerned. Really, what I want to start peeling the layers back on are some of the biases attached to it here because okay. now I've addressed the audience's bias and right. literally I would I would be you in the seat um, and yes. being like you never know what you're gonna see too like you could be seeing the start of somebody's fantastic career and look at what yeah, you can yep. say you saw. Um, not unusual at all. Not at all. I, but, I mean, it's, it's, especially in opera. I mean, it happens almost all the time. I hear it all the time in the opera world. Yeah. So, so my takeaway for tourists is give it a chance. Now, what I want to, when we're talking about um, performer health, because this is really super close, I know, for both of us, as far as this is concerned. Um, and I'm going to go back to the Post article for a minute, because it, it also... You know, Diana Rigg mentions what's lost. Like, we had a generation who, you know, we were on death's door, but we performed anyway. And she goes into almost like, I called it pornographic detail about her injury from Medea, where she's like, they put a camera down my throat. I could see the tear. There was a note in the spectrum of my voice that I could not hit. No sound would come out. So I had to reorchestrate all those speeches and arias to avoid that note. It was a fascinating exercise in learning how to keep going. Did she ever think of taking a day off? Never. We hold this stuff as some sort of, am I the only one who finds that not comforting at all? I'm like, why are we, I'm like, she's not really injured. Like, we shouldn't be kind of going, that's a fantastic thing. It's like, you probably should have taken some days off. <laughs> that's my thing. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, I feel like there's, there are two things that are happening here. Mm -hmm. There is the Dame Diana thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's the reality. Yeah. Uh, I feel like she is is being a martyr here. A little um, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and thank you. Those it's, are it's so not <laughs> about that. Yeah. Um, right. Obviously. Yay. Okay. So you <laughs> ruined your voice for this great performance. That's a choice you made, and, and if ultimately you want to be known for that, great. But here's here's another thing. Okay, we want to be extremely healthy at vocal and physical athletes when we approach the stage, right? Yeah. I know that I have an advantage because of my operatic background when it comes to musical theater. Yes. I can go a lot longer than some of some of my uh, friends only because I've trained my voice that way. Here's the thing. Say, you I, have built-in, you have built-in, in a way, also from day one, maintenance techniques, I guess. Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. But, like, you want to talk about, like, f the physicality. Like, I'm, a, I'm not a dancer. I don't have the dancer's body. I don't have it. That's going to, that takes a lot more toll on me. So yeah. it just so happens mm -hmm. that if I'm in, a, in a, a vocally demanding musical theater piece, it's not necessary. I'm going to be able to say, I, I should not call in, mm -hmm. uh, I could do this role sick. That's only because I prepared that certain way. Yeah. Right. But you know what? Let me, let me offer up a very modern. modern it would be like that for me. Let me open up a, or pull up a very modern. I watched this happen. Um, 
freshman year of college, I thought I had disposable income. Uh, I, I had, I was able to see from almost day one of Wicked with Adina Menzel as Alphaba. I got in, like the show had been open a week, I won the lottery. And so I got to see everybody right at the beginning of this run. And famously, Adina Menzel talked about how she never missed a performance leading up to the Tonys. And yes, she won the Tony. But mm -hmm. I, I would be lying if I said, I didn't note because I did also get to go back. I saw like cancellation tickets I got in a few months later. Like I was obsessed with Wicked. I love it. I, I'm just, <laughs> it's a good show. Uh, and I love The Wizard of Oz. So there's that. Um, but over the course of basically from that was October of 2003 up to June of 2004, I actually was really sad by the time we got to the Tony's performance because she was exhausted, mm. you know, yeah. and and she had done some things to her voice, which this is just my personal we always put our, our disclaimer on this. This is our personal opinion. Yeah. yeah. Um, I felt she had really done some lasting damage to her voice and I don't feel she's been the same since. And that, so that there's a not... difference. There's a difference between calling out mm -hmm. because um, you don't feel good mm -hmm. and scheduling a pause in your, a regular pause in your schedule so mm -hmm. that you don't do damage so that you don't, aren't exhausted there's a difference between thinking ahead and being mm -hmm. smart about your instrument and knowing what your body can and can't handle and running into a wall, getting sick, and then having to have your understudy come on because you physically aren't making notes, aren't you know, making sound. It's so funny. I was, I've been, I read over the last year and I'm, uh, I went back to reference it for this William Daniels book. And he talks yes. about in the original run of 1776, um, how he really, he was in the show for two and a half years. Um, he quote, I missed only two performances in those two years plus. And he talks about one was he had a couple, <laughs> a few too many drinks in his dressing room after a matinee with some friends. That was one. <laughs> and the other oh one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oops. John can't do the evening. Oh well. Uh, and the other one was they had been asked to go perform for the White House. Yes, Nixon was in office at the time. Um, and um, like the, the next day, like apparently that was actually understudy Palooza because they had just traveled to Washington, D.C. and back and had a show the next night um but he also talks about um kind of the things he had to do because you're talking about an eight performances a week and he'd done shows up until then like he yeah. mostly he was a play guy but uh when he stepped into the world of musical and realized just how heavy the adams track was yeah. like and he didn't have an alternate they didn't do that and he's kind right. of he sort of leans into this thing about he, he's proud. He's another one like Diana Rigg who's proud of the fact that he did it without a break. And he talks about how Mondays, he was a champ. Mondays are traditionally your day off. It's changed a little bit with the runs of shows nowadays. Um, but Monday is your traditional dark day. And how basically he had to almost have an ENT on call every week to kind of put him back in order. Like, Humpty Dumpty. So yeah. he didn't make any sound at all. And I'm sitting here going, this isn't a great thing to be forwarding to, to performers nowadays. Like, you're making it sound like you barely got there. Also, I kind of wrote next to it as a note, oh, your own personal ENT must be nice to afford that. Um, yeah. And I love William Daniels. Anyway, um, so it's like I, I worry about kind of the message you're sending to younger performers because I think we should also bring into the room at this point the shows have changed. The style of music <laughs> has changed. We prize a belt, almost a skrelt now, particularly for female performers. Prize, I know, I know. But, yeah. and, and these young singers want to emulate that. And no, they don't have the benefit of like you, Juliana, the, the training and the background, understanding how to properly generate those notes and those sounds. Well, uh, yeah. I have a lot of thoughts here. Well, so I was going to say, you're what? a voice teacher, so let me hand this to you. But this yeah, is my fine. feeling. Yeah, we are churning out. OK, mm -hmm. when Chorus Line came out and it's about how hard it is and the competition. Uh, what is this? Almost 50 years ago? Yeah. Oh, God, um, that just made my brain hurt, <laughs> but you're not wrong. Oh, that the was 71. Is, Good Lord. The, okay. the theater world, the Broadway world is so much more saturated. There are so many more degree programs. People are going, you know, starting from when they are in junior high saying, I'm going to go to college for musical theater and mm -hmm. I'm going to have a Broadway career. There are so many people pursuing this career right now, um, more than ever. So let's, when we, let's, when we talk about the old guard, mm -hmm. yes. um, I don't know that the, the requirements are that much different. Um, the, te the technical requirements, because really belting from a voice po teacher's point of view is actually, 
not hard on your voice. If you're, if you're belting correctly, it's not hard on your voice at all. But you don't feel uh, like a trend towards pop has mutated the sound and the, the sound that they're they're wanting to hear? Pop is not is not demanding on your voice at all. Okay, okay. Okay, because it's meant to have a, a mic in your face, right. right? And then musical theater, we move the mic up here. Yes. Right, and then... At least in, one, if not one on your hat and one on your... Yeah. Yeah, and then like summer stock or outdoor performance, you know, so sometimes we have no no amplification at all. So these are three different techniques. Right. The thing is, with so many degree programs out there and so many voice teachers uh, out there, there is no excuse for so many singers coming with at, coming at the, this career with poor technique, but it's happening why this is a whole other thing but you know you got again you got to think about it this is a money making thing uh, so for some producers so they couldn't care less really about the your career pro trajectory right yeah do it you're, for your you're contract. a 21 year old uh, musical yeah. theater singer from Carnegie Mellon they could not care less what your career looks like when you're 60 years old so there is this idea of well what can what can approximate this pop sound? Uh, and, and then you can do this thing. Anybody can do this thing. But there's a way to do it that takes a little extra work, a little extra technique, a little extra forth thought. And then there's a way to do it where you immediately have this sound, right? And so some teachers are trying to make a lot of money where they immediately give you that sound. Well, because people are also very instant gratification. I would Correct. say that is definitely something that's crept into our society. So it, it, it makes them want to bypass proper technique work. Is okay. that, would you say that's fair? Absolutely. I think that's, that, that's absolutely on point. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the truth is like when I tell my, my students this and my friends, this, the competition is not as steep as you think it is. Um, when, if you know your stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously we want to have a career. Th these performers I would hope they want to have a career where they're healthy, strong, where they can still maintain relationships and still maintain this gorgeous singing voice well into their eighties and nineties. Right. This does not always happen. And we look at the old guard. It's funny. I'm preparing right now. Um, uh, uh, Neely in Valley of the Dolls. And yep. so I'm, I'm very much immersed in this world of like paying your comeuppance. But there's this idea when you look at golden age Broadway, right? Or what's happening mid-century for us. There is this snowflake oh. idea where you're either a star or you're not. Yeah. And the truth is right now, there are a hell of a lot of performers who are star quality, mm -hmm. who are right now just kind of paying their dues. They're being understudies, they're swings. And let me tell you something else about being a swing and an understudy. <laughs> How else do you think you're going to get your endurance? Exactly. Oh, I no. got it. Endurance is something you build up. It's, you don't magically appear in this world. Training, uh, unless, it's like training any muscle. And, and honestly, it doesn't come overnight. And that's that's one of those things I find myself on a mantra right now when I'm trying to do things like finally get a military push-up done correctly and then start messing around and doing things like crow push-ups or inversions and things. And, you know, you're going to fall on your ass a bit, but yeah. if you put in the proper work and you build it up, yeah, you're going to build a hell of a strong instrument. So yeah, I, and something I, else, thousand percent. We're, we're also plugging into roles. Again, think again as a producer. We're plugging in people who are primarily known as uh, from their uh, screen work, right? They're, they do t TV, like Lauren Ambrose. So they do film uh, also, like Hugh Jackman. Mm -hmm. um, so we're plugging in these big name roles who may not, their endurance may not. They haven't been kicking around in the regional theater world for 10, 20 years. Their endurance is a different animal. It's not that they're less talented, but yeah. their endurance is at a different place, okay? Maybe, maybe you, musical theater person who's used to work, 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 would lose your mind on set because you have to sit by yourself in the trailer for it's six finite hours work. and it's that yeah. is a different kind of um endurance because that is yeah. being able to deliver consistency time after time after time after time so in the editing room you've got something that looks like it was a continuous 10 minute scene or yeah. be able to pull something completely different out of your ass for a different take that Correct. Your director has. right <laughs> Correct. So, so i feel like if you understand the world <laughs> this is like my motto in life. If you actually understand the world you live in outside of your bubble, what's going on, how can you take offense yeah. to this situation? Totally, totally. Um, I have, I had one more area. This is going to, you know what? I knew the soapbox was going to be a long segment, but I'm loving how we're getting into this. So I'm just going to, I want to put this on there. Do you feel that, 
it's harder on women to have an alternate than men who have alternates because I also got to see the situation with, um, for instance, John Lloyd Young after winning the Tony for Jersey Boys. Uh, and Frankie Valley is a vocally dumb man. He carries the whole show on his shoulders the entire night. I mm-hmm. got to see, he, after the Tony, he picked up an alternate and there was a little bit of scuttlebutt about it because they were like, oh, well, now John's too good. He won the Tony, now he's too good to do Sunday shows. But let me tell you, his alternate, Michael Longoria, is who is now P.S. touring with the Midtown Men and has a fantastic instrument. Uh-huh. Like, I think it was smart of John to do that. But I feel like the scuttlebutt on that was on a different level than, say, you've got an alternate going on, like in in the case we're in right now with My Fair Lady. I mean, like, I just, do you think there's a gender bias or is this just me looking at it with my girl school brain as always? (laughs) I am always more than happy to point out sexual discrimination. I, in this instance, haven't, it's not sent off a radar. I mean, the only thing I, that I think of immediately is that there are so many more, I feel it's much more competitive Mm. for women out there. And so I feel like it's maybe, um, a gift to a standby or understudy that they would get to perform more, uh, in those tracks. Right. Um, no, I I mean, not necessarily. I don't know. It could be a thing. I just, it doesn't strike me. It's, It's just one of those things where, because I do, I always do my best to stay away from gossip rags and whatnot, but I was very much in high school and college, you know, message board lurker girl. And I do know that kind of the, the fan buzz and the chatter and internet trolling, I feel like it's stronger around women who have an alternate than around guys who have an alternate. Um, that, that, that's, again, this is just my take on it, but I feel like it's really sad that that's the case. Yeah, for sure. Because, because honestly, it's not saying that women are quote any weaker in this capacity and it's not say (laughs) frankly it's saying this is a very demanding score and it you need someone else it's being a smart performer going back to what you said and being able to build yourself up for endurance versus going 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 until you get yourself injured which with my with my also for a long time as an athlete background i completely recognize because i know girls who went at it and went at it and went at it and had arthroscopic knee surgery at 14 uh, and are no longer playing versus the girls who maybe did a couple different sports modalities yeah. or stepped back for periods of time who are still able to be fully functional. Uh, maybe they never wound up on the big old pro stage, but they, you know, their body ne- also didn't betray them by the age of 25 yeah. and they're in a body cast. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, no, it's, it's, been a really really good conversation and this has been in my brain for a while i mean as 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 gossipy and backstage whispery as the article that got this started goes being the post i'm glad yeah. that that's you know that did beget like a really good conversation if anybody mm-hmm. wants to have you know talk to us about this further yeah you can pop, us, pop us an email uh strange yep. true deer at gmail or if you want to tweet to us you know at strange deer like you know this is I want to hear thoughts on this, Um, uh, particularly maybe just from my angle, I want to hear what fellow maybe message boardy lurkery people can you support (laughs) or refute what I've said about what fan scuttlebutt seems to be, Um, just just because I'm I'm fascinated if that's the same as when I was 21 and and (laughs) being way too interested in buzz versus, you know, industry. Uh, (laughs) That's That's a very interesting distinction, and I think that's important. Yep. So what is making us strange is, I love how my hair is drying on camera. Look at it. I know. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Which is good because I actually have to work in a couple hours. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's making us strange this week? I have another story, Juliana. Okay. Um, I'm going to read to you. And it ties into everything. Um, this is from that fine literary uh, source, the Twitter. Um, I had one of the all-time best conversations with a condescending theater-goer who sat in front of me at intermission of My Fair Lady. Here's a transcript. Condescending theater-goer. Well, I didn't know this show had so many laughs. You were certainly enjoying yourself. Passive-aggressive, shaming at me for laughing at the jokes. Me, 
yep, it's a great show. Um, condescending theater goer. He starts shorthanding it to CT here. CT. Okay. Oh, yeah, I've seen it a million times. I like old-fashioned musicals. Emphasis on old-fashioned. Clearly, he doesn't like my show. Me. So do I. This is one of my favorites. My cheer is throwing him off. CT. I like shows where you can understand all the words. Huh. All right. Let's get into it. Me. So do I. What are you referring to? Look at him dead in the eye. I stare at him. My question's hanging in the air. He blinks, like he just realized he's talking to a real person three sentences into this. <laughs> CT. Oh, man. S sorry, I'm being an ass. Nice long pause from me. Yep. I go back to reading my program. Two minutes later, CT. I'm sorry, can we just, can we just forget that conversation ever happened? Me, in my program. Yep. Act two begins. I enjoy the show. Laugh out loud at all the jokes. <laughs> Uh, the lesson here, my friends, is there, if there is any, is there's always the type of theater goer who defines themselves by excluding others. You could write musicals and they'll still try to make you feel like you don't belong. Don't you dare let them. You love theater, you belong. Welcome. Lin-Manuel Miranda. Nice! <laughs> he had someone be in a sass hound in front of him at My Fair Lady last week. And he tweets out the transcript of this situation, and he handles wow. that so well, and yeah. doesn't doesn't let the guy bait him. You know, I like musicals; we can understand all the words. And he's like, mm -hmm, "Me too." <laughs> I actually omitted because at one point he's like, "I can tell he's talking about Hamilton." I dropped that. I was like, "I can hear he's talking about my show," uh, yeah. because I wanted to hold that till the end. But um, there are a couple things in what's making me strange this week. First of all, I read that thread, and I got such a warm feeling in my heart. Um, partly because of, uh, because of Lynn and Hamilton, but also because I remember one of the first times I ever went to the theater with my husband, Packy, who is a loud laugher. You know, yeah, it's Julia. It's great. <laughs> when he's enjoying something, and he's also bad at faking it. Like, when, when he's in the audience not hearing, then you know something's not right on stage. Um, but he, you know, he's a loud laugher. And I've been in the audience yeah. with people who've sort of thrown side shade. And, and I used to. Really? Our first couple dates. I actually felt really like Packy reined it in. Like, that's too much. Don't be, don't be so, like... Oh, wow. And then I stopped myself after a little while, and I went, who the hell am I? My then-boyfriend is really enjoying this show right now. And how about instead of being in my head, I yeah. let myself enjoy it, too, and F what those people around us are thinking. Because I'm here to have my moment with the theater. He's not being, you know, he's not throwing popcorn at the stage and being, he's enjoying himself. Yeah. An expression of joy. So why are we shaming each other for enjoying it? We should, we should be embracing the best part about live theater, which is a shared experience. <laughs> yes. A shared, joyful experience. So, you know, and also like performances where I know that Packy or like Alex <laughs> Oleski are going to be in the audience. I get really excited because they give you that feedback as a performer that you want really badly. You're not supposed to want it, but when oh. it comes, you feel elated and that the audience is responsive. It improves the quality of the performance, quite frankly, I've always felt. I'm like, yeah. this audience is with us. We've all had that yep. experience in the theater. Yep. We come off stage and we're like, these Start guys are with us tonight. This yeah. is awesome. Yeah, so I guess reading Lynn's tweets, and by the way, let me just put in a quick plug because he just announced this this morning. Uh, Lynn and Miranda has turned... Um, a little side mission of let me brighten up Twitter a little bit just by being a wholesome, happy person on a platform that's generally, you know, thought of as this is where I go to vomit about politics or to troll someone for their body image or whatever. Lynn has gone, oh, no, no, I'm going to make this your moment of happy every morning. And he does morning and evening tweets that make me so happy. And they're, oh. sort of, they're directly to the person who's reading them. And oh, they're, nice. they're little nuggets and they're sweet. And um, he has just posted this morning, three hours ago, uh, a bit of news. At your request, we made a book of good mornings and good nights, illustrated. So look for Good Morning, Good Night, Little Pep Talks for Me and You by Lin-Manuel Miranda, coming out October 23rd. Like, Amazing. I think, That's awesome. And I really, I really look forward to his morning and evening tweets. And I yeah. will periodically retweet like the ones that I love, because sometimes he's just so on point. It's like, hey... You look really tired right now. 
let's take a rest. Tomorrow mm-hmm. will be there for us. You worked hard today. It's like, it's just so sweet. It's like that That's little, great. and it's in tweet form. So it's not like a big, long motivational Tony Robbins. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's a little nugget that you can have right here. And it just, it, it's so lovely. So what's making me strange this week, I guess, is something that's just making me feel, you know, fizzy and happy. And thank you, Lin-Manuel, for putting that out. Oh, the- I love that. Yep. <laughs> so what's up with you? <laughs> okay. Well, remember last week we talked about uh, Desert Island books. Um, oh, yes, And I briefly mentioned my book of sonnets. Uh, so this is it. Hello. Um, and the reason I, th- I got this out was because I am packing for a trip. And um, when, particularly when it's acting related or I'm doing a show, I do like to pack um, my the books that I use that inspire me. I just kind of like to have them on my bag. But also, like, I hate waiting around. And I'm, I don't like grabbing my phone as soon as I... Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know what I'm saying? The, the negative space comes. I, I don't want to grab my phone. Reach into the choir. I'm a fan of the book. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I was putting this in my bag and I was like, you know what I need to do for strange. I need to just go through what are my, not only my desert Island books, but like the books that I, if I have to be away, um, for a show, I will pack with me. You ready for this? I'm going to try to go right. real fast. Right. Yep. Good. So some of these are, some of these are technique books. One of my favorite, te- well, so we were talking about it. I was going to say, wait a minute. You're in the zone. Yeah. <laughs> Here it is. I don't, in it. Yeah, I don't know if what came first, the chicken or the egg situation. But um, if you're an actor or singer or a s- acting singer uh, or a dancer who sings or acts, you need to be um, reading and studying Kristen Linkletter, um, her voice. So freeing the natural voice is kind of like the four beginners. If you have were in a degree program for singing or speaking, you probably had this as your study text. But Familiar, it's, um, yep. All, I read it all the time. Amazing stuff. Um, and then she also has uh, freeing Shakespeare's voice, which um, I use uh, frequently as well. Also for technique uh, is Impro, Improvisation in the Theater by Keith Johnstone. Oh. Great um, technical book. Okay, then this other books kind of um, inspire my way of thinking. So this is a fun book. I legit carry this around with me in my bag all the time because it's little along with my sonnets. It's a list, a book of surrealist games. Um, <laughs> I cannot explain this. They're kind of, some of them are like party game type situations, but if you're you. by yourself um, <laughs> and you need to just kind of get out of your head. I get asked a lot, actually, by students. This is one of my soapboxes. This is the cool uh, cool downs uh, after particularly taxing roles. And I tend to gravitate toward edgier, um, uh, emotionally demanding roles. So uh, this is one of my cool downs uh, and some of my warm-ups if I'm playing a role that's uh, a little hard to get into. Okay. Nice. I love it. Others. If, this, is a, this is a rated R book. Oh, please. Okay. This is Dear Lover by David Dita. Um, the reason I like this book as an actor is because it deals with how, uh, we as sexual beings are in real life. Okay. That's all I'm going to say. About I that. No, that's cool. Hey, you know, <laughs> not judging whatever you need. Acknowledging that is like a big step. And actually, um, it's, it's one of my audition strategies. Okay. So. Another, another book that's not an acting book, but I think it's good for this, this genre of book is very good for actors. This is actually, um, like a, it's a psychology book. It's called extraordinary relationships, a new way of thinking about human interactions because we're actors. All we do all day long is human interactions. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 And if you don't spend a little bit of time poking around psychology, you're not doing it right. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No matter your type, I feel like you have to have this book um, in your uh, repertoire. This is The Art of War. Ooh. You just got to have it. Hold it in front of your face because we're in a split screen. So this is going to, there it is. Yep. Aha. Nice. Oh, right. Split screen. Okay. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah, Art of War. Um, you just, you need to know this. Okay. Then uh, the, the next category and final category is Other Actor Inspiration. So if you're going to go contemporary, I really, really like this book by, uh, by Jenna Fisher, The Actor's Life. Ooh. 
Okay. If, so if you're a contemporary actor and you do contemporary things, um, this is extremely useful to, when talking about the theater and TV and film career trajectory. It's very practical, very easy to read, um, and inspiring. You, you get a lot of information if you're looking for it. You get a lot of information about how the industry works and what's smart. Um, and then if you want to go into the classical world, I just I got this book for um, Mother's Day. And I am crazy about it. It's Year of the King, an actor's diary and sketchbook by Anthony Cher. Ooh. Uh, this, he is a Shakespearean actor. This is marvelous. Nice. In every way, shape, and form. And then my favorite, you pro you've probably seen this. This is always in my, always, always, always in my bag um, that has my like audition book. I actually pulled this out for a show we did together. Uh, and gave uh, an, a little inspirational moment from it. Oh, yeah. This is The Mystic in the Theater, uh, Eleonora Doucet by Ava Legallien. Um, she is a classical, was a classical actress um, in the 20th century, early 20th century. Check it out. Incredibly inspiring, especially if you do classical theater or if you feel a spiritual connection to the theater like I do. I'm laughing because the word that I always write all over our running order moving forward is takeaway and I think you just gave us all the takeaway plus uh, uh, Tiffany <laughs> Barnes and Noble. Uh, <laughs> good on you. We are making the no money. Takeaway is expand your mind people. Yes <laughs> and then when you're done expanding your mind you just need to relax. Read a Lin-Manuel Miranda tweet. That's right. I love it. Remarkable how dry your hair is right now. <laughs> you know, I really, I rarely, rarely uh, use a hair dryer unless I'm really up against it. Looks it looks so good. It's got that beautiful, like, point. natural wave. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, that's going to be fun to watch. I was like, I'm going to encourage people to watch this episode if just to see how my hair, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that wraps up a fun episode of Stranger. Fun with a lot of... Uh, Initially, I was like, oh, this is going to be heavy, but no, we, I think there was a lot of really good stuff we got into here, Juliana, and we could definitely revisit this, this in the future. I say that every week, <laughs> but, you know, especially, especially in these things, I think when we get into our wheelhouse and we're talking about acting in the theater process, we are, we're finding a lot of our like-minded folk. So thank you, like-minded folk, for, uh, for watching today or listening or whatever platform. The joy of our show is you can do either. <laughs> where, where can they find us if they're just listening though, Juliana we talked about visual oh yeah and if you are a podcast listener you can download uh, uh, and subscribe to us wherever you get your uh, your podcast iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher iHeartRadio etc 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 we are all there for it so excellent and uh, on that note I suppose we should let everybody go but we can't let them go before we remind them to what Juliana Stay strange, dear. But not in a way that gets you arrested. Or if you do get arrested, you didn't hear it from us. I need to stop making that longer and longer. And I was going to say, <laughs> I'm gonna, I am begging you as an old lady to as keep our tagline short. Because I fear some, it's becoming not but what it's But if someone gets arrested and we're sued, it's my disclaimer on the night. We're done. Go to the crime. To quote my favorite, char my favorite character actor... I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Good night, Seattle. We love you. My favorite. <laughs>